Goedendag, welkom bij onze live videoconferentie met Esther Berospe, de CEO, CEO van de luiermaker Ontex. Zij leidt CEO sinds begin 2021 en was voordien enkele jaren bestuurder bij het bedrijf. Uh, welkom Esther. Jullie kunnen je vragen stellen aan Esther via de website van de tijd en dan rol zij hier gewoon onze studio binnen. Uh, I'm glad you could join us uh, to uh, answer some questions of our readers. Now, Ontex has gone through uh, a rough time the last couple of years. First, we had the pandemic, of course. Uh, then we had uh, the war in Ukraine, which is causing a serious rise of uh, inflation, cost inflation, which is hitting your margins. Now, there were a few... Uh, questions from our readers that we already received beforehand uh, on the strategy. First of all, a question from Stan. He asks, how do you compete with the A brands? And can you elaborate a bit on the technological advances Ontex is making? And are there any innovations in your sector we should know about? Okay. So first of all, thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure uh, to be able to have this chat with uh, your readers. Um, on the innovation, uh, for us and for Ontex, uh, over the more than 40 years that we've been operating, it has been very important to have a good cadence of innovation. Because in reality, uh, uh, what we do is uh, you, we need to offer uh, similar innovation than the A brands. Uh, with a lower cost uh, because uh, basically our retailers want to position uh, the products that they sell uh, with similar innovation, similar propositions for consumer at a slightly lower cost. So uh, maybe to, to name uh, two recent uh, innovation launches that we've done uh, is uh, on the one hand on the baby category. Uh, we have uh, completely changed the core of the product. Uh, it's called Climaflex uh, and the objective of this core is to have a uh, uh, to use, uh, in a way, less material, so to have a better performance in terms of absorption, but also skin care, so to make sure that, uh, you know, the humidity stays within the core and it doesn't touch uh, the skin of the baby. So uh, with this innovation, we are uh, delivering a better performance in terms of absorption and skin care, and at the same time, uh, better cost, uh, because we are using uh, less uh, raw material. It has been launched uh, at the end of uh, last year, and it has been uh, very well accepted by uh, by the customers and uh, the final consumer. It has the same qualities as the A brands. Yes, as and uh, I would say that uh, we are uh, the only uh, company that can offer a similar level of performance and core technology uh, compared to A brands. At, at a cheaper point. price. At a cheaper price, yeah. Uh, the second uh, innovation is very different uh, uh, because it is um, directed to uh, the healthcare channel. So this is, uh, you know, the business that we have with uh, um, hospitals, uh, nursing homes, uh, um, selling adult uh, products for the elderly people. And uh, basically what we have developed is uh, um, a solution uh, which goes beyond the product. Uh, it is a smart diaper. Uh, so it is a very special uh, diaper that has a special link uh, to, uh, that uh, can connect uh, to a chip, uh, an electronic chip. Uh, so that uh, with this, uh, we can detect uh, the level of humidity in the diaper, where the humidity is. Uh, we connect to an app. Uh, so uh, in this case, the nurses or the caregivers can check uh, when uh, the diaper needs to be changed. Uh, and with this, uh, not only we uh, reduce the use of diapers, uh, which is reducing waste and reducing cost, uh, but we give better care to, uh, to the elderly people, especially during the night, uh, when uh, because they don't need to be awakened just to check if uh, if uh, if the product needs to be changed. So we are in the phase in the phase of testing uh, this solution in different countries with different uh, customers, and uh, the feedback has been extremely positive. We have discovered uh, that uh, not only, uh, you know, there is a significant saving in the usage of products in, uh, you know, uh, the bed linen uh, needs to be washed uh, less often, uh, but also there is a much better care. And also uh, it allows uh, to have a more efficient uh, use of the time of the nurses. Nurses are today, uh, you know, an scarce... Uh, um, yeah, they, uh, they, they don't have uh, much time they, left, of course. No, and, and uh, you know, for, for the institutions, it's difficult to find nurses. Uh, they have really heavy workload. So with this, uh, we expect uh, to also, uh, you know, improve uh, the, the, the way they work. And you're the first to do that? We are, uh, you know, we are piloting, uh, but there is no s this type of solution in the market yet. You know, I, I would assume that some of the, our competitors are also developing their own solutions. But uh, this is very exciting innovation uh, because, uh, you know, we would uh, not only 
sell a product, uh, but a service, uh, and this would allow us to get into more of a kind of a full service um, solution rather than just uh, selling products. Chips in diapers, and, and you have enough chips uh, to make that product? That's a good question. Because there is scarcity in the sector, that's, of course. That's a good question. Uh, you know, especially since COVID, uh, I need to say that the supply chain has been uh, extremely disrupted. Uh, we have gone through ups and downs uh, for different reasons uh, over the past uh, couple of years. And uh, this has forced uh, our company and I guess every company to become uh, more agile on the way we uh, we manage the overall supply chain. And this is about how we procure raw materials uh, and also how we deliver uh, the products to our... Uh, okay, in, uh, I think there are some questions uh, on that subject later on. Because we have another question from uh, uh, Jan Gerard. He says in Flanders, OVM, you, you, you probably know uh, uh, that company, uh, Ov- the OVM, like its sister organizations in other countries, is promoting washable diapers and discourages disposable diapers. How how are you dealing with that trend? Yes. So we Do you have, offer washable diapers as well? Yes. So we offer what we call hybrid diapers, uh, which basically uh, is diapers uh, with uh, two parts. Uh, there is an external uh, part that is washable. It's cotton-based uh, kind of um, uh, exterior, uh, which is washable. And then we, uh, we offer a disposable um, um, interior part. It's a more uh, durable solution then. So, uh, and the reason behind, you know, we are uh, looking at fully um, um, recyclable products, uh, but today uh, we haven't found, uh, uh, you know, a solution that offers the same level of performance and performance, especially on baby diapers, is very important. Uh, but uh, we have launched this hybrid solution at the end of last year, and uh, you know I am very excited. And it, uh, it, we have launched it with our own brand, uh, Little Big Change, uh, in France and uh, in, uh, in the Benelux. Uh, but now we are in the process to uh, uh, to offer it to our customers also. Okay. Another question, uh, an important one, I think. Uh, reader LVD asks, what is a unique selling? Uh, point, uh, your unique selling proposition of Ontex. Why do customers such as supermarkets prefer your products? So I think it's a combination of, uh, of uh, different things. So on the one hand, uh, you know, we are, uh, we've been uh, doing a business very focused uh, on, uh, you know, baby, adult and femcare products uh, for more than 40 years. Uh, so there is a certain uh, level of know-how uh, that allows us to uh, have a really good innovation cadence uh, and, uh, and, uh, agility to really follow the trends in the market. Uh, so that's uh, that's it's a key point. Uh, so offering the right innovations with the right level of quality, uh, right cost and uh, good level of service, which is very important for our customers. The second um, thing that I would like to mention is our scale and our overall footprint. Uh, you know, we are uh, we have a global scale. We have uh, 19 uh, factories uh, around the globe and that uh, allows us to really, on the one hand, get to know different consumers, different trends. Uh, so be very close to the consumers, uh, leverage some of the trends that are happening in certain areas for offering innovation in other areas. We've been doing that, bringing trends from Europe to the US and vice versa. Um, but also the scale uh, you know, allows us to offer you know, a different level of, uh, of, um, of cost. So uh, those would be, if I would think, you know, the, the really um, deep product innovation and um, and our footprint would be, uh, I, I would say, an asset compared to uh, other competitors in, in okay. the industry. Okay, durable company. Yes. <laughs> Laura K asks, what was the impact of Corona? And then uh, another question, uh, what about the war in Ukraine, which makes the prices of raw materials uh, go up? Maybe first, uh, the first part of the question, the impact of Corona on Ontex? And is there still an impact? So um, I would say that uh, there, are, there is, um, I don't think it's over, to be honest. Uh, there, are, there was a huge impact at the beginning. Uh, we had to learn uh, to become more agile uh, on everything, on the way we worked in the offices, on the way we worked uh, with our customers and, uh, and suppliers. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the, the, the organization was uh, very resilient uh, and uh, open uh, to change the way uh, of working. And, uh, you know, we have had specific moments in which the situation was very critical, uh, but I think we have always um, uh, reacted uh, very fast and uh, kind of normalized our operations uh, in a very fast manner. So all in all, when I look back uh, over the past two years, uh, you know, I think uh, the level of service that we have uh, 
uh, provided with our customers has been uh, very high. Uh, our factories remained open uh, all the time. Of course, uh, in certain moments, uh, we had a very high level of absenteeism driven by um, the level of infections, especially in certain markets. But all in all, I think uh, uh, we always reacted very fast. And, uh, you know, the the common... Uh, um, uh, yeah, and you also produced mouth caps at a yes, certain moment. Yes, and then, uh, in fact, uh, very good. Uh, thank you for uh, reminding me. Uh, we... Uh, um, we basically uh, acquired a machine to produce masks uh, in uh, one of our factories. In do you Benzu. still do that? Uh, not, not, not anymore. So we have done it uh, massively during the pandemic period, but uh, not anymore. The demand has gone down dramatically, mm. and uh, we prefer to focus on other. Okay, let's hope uh, the worst of the pandemic yeah. is over. But the machine is ready yeah. if, uh, <laughs> uh, in case of need. In case of emergency, yes. yeah. Uh, Maybe uh, on the war on Ukraine and your position in Russia and Ukraine, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think there are there are two aspects on that question. One is, you know, the business in Russia and Ukraine, and the second, what is the impact on the raw material uh, cost? On the first one, uh, we have a, a local for local business in Russia. It is around five uh, percent of our revenues, a hundred million um, euro business. We have uh, a factory uh, in Noginsk, uh, very close to uh, Moscow. And uh, basically, it's a local for local business, so it serves it's still the operational. business. Um, we have a very small business also in Ukraine uh, with a commercial, uh, uh, a very small commercial organization that was supplied uh, basically from Russia and also from some of the European uh, factories. I, uh, for the first uh, thing for us has been a focus on the safety of our employees, and I am happy to, to report that uh, all our people in uh, in uh, Ukraine are safe uh, and. Uh, we have uh, completely resumed our operations in Ukraine uh, and um, in Russia. We uh, uh, have uh, stopped uh, all our investments, so we had uh, planned uh, significant investments in the region, so we have stopped everything. Uh, the plant uh, is operational, but at a much lower scale, uh, on the one hand, because uh, it is uh, difficult to procure uh, raw materials, uh, so the key raw materials uh, that are not uh, um, present in the local market. Uh, but second is because we are really focusing on producing the, the very, very uh, necessary materials to, to serve the population. But you're not so basically baby diapers and adult. Uh, mostly. You're not thinking uh, about selling the Russian factory. So we we continue to monitor the situation. Uh, the situation is changing every day, and uh, and we continue to adjust uh, our plans based on the situation. Right now, we continue to operate. Okay, speaking on geography, Jos V has another question. He asks uh, in USA. Ontex is expanding with a new production facility, the, but he, he says, yeah, the labor market in the U.S. is very tight. Do you find enough employees? And how important is the USA in your strategy? So starting from the last uh, question, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, is very important in our strategy. It's one of our core markets. It is a 15 billion uh, market. Uh, it's almost the same size than the, the total Europe. Um, and uh, it is interesting because we have a smaller uh, or a, a smaller position compared to Europe, where we uh, are, you know, the leading uh, uh, manufacturer on retailer brands. Uh, but also because uh, there is a big opportunity for retailer brands to continue to grow because the, the share of retailer brands in the total market in the U.S. is smaller than in Europe. And why is that? Mainly driven by the fact that uh, the, the retailers, the strategy of retailers has been more on selling very basic products. So they have not been offering the same level of innovation of a brands like retailers in Europe have been doing. And what we are doing is we are bringing the, the great portfolio of products that we have in Europe to North America. So we are in a way disrupting the market and bringing solutions that in Europe have been uh, you know, selling for many years like channels, uh, like pans, into the North American market that uh, was uh, offering more basic products. So you see more growth in uh, North America yes. than so, in Europe. And, uh, and it is a combination of uh, growing market share. Uh, but also uh, yeah, there is a, a, another business that is very important for us. Uh, we call it lifestyle brands. Uh, these are premium brands that offer natural sustainable products. Uh, sometimes also they are focusing on recycling and compostability. Um, it is all about good for you, good for the planet. Uh, and uh, we have a very strong position historically in that uh, segment with around 50% market share. We have many customers and we see those customers growing uh, very rapidly. Uh, those customers uh, uh, sell uh, or go to market uh, uh, digitally online. And uh, they are uh, starting to be very present also on the retailer, on the big retailers. 
and uh, this is uh, also a vehicle for us uh, for growth. So historically, to answer the question on the on the factory, historically we've been uh, serving this uh, this uh, business from uh, a factory that we have in in the border between uh, the U.S. and Mexico in Tijuana. Uh, but now, we, because the, the business is growing so fast, uh, we have decided that we need to have a local production. So we will continue uh, using our facility in Mexico, especially to cover the West Coast. But we are now in the process of, um, actually, we have already opened a new plant in North Carolina and we are already ship- shipping. It's just operational then? It is operational and we are already shipping. We started produ- production at the beginning of the year and we have started shipments uh, in, uh, in Q2. Okay, so it's good to but see that you're uh, still expanding. But the market expanding. is difficult. Eh? To answer to the question, the U.S. market is very difficult. The level of un- unemployment is, is very low, and it is uh, it is not easy to find uh, to staff. Uh, but, of course, I mean, uh, we need to make sure that we are competitive. And uh, at this point, we are operational the, 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 with uh, two lines. And, of course, the objective is to continue to grow and, and, to, uh, and to fill in the, 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 the facility. Yeah. Uh. Okay. Uh, Herman Bullens has a question on, on China. To what degree are you dependent on raw material, materials from China? We do source uh, and historically have sourced uh, materials from China, but uh, not, not, a, not a lot, to be honest. It's not a big portion of uh, the materials that we supply. Uh, we've always uh, had uh, multiple sources, uh, for, uh, especially for the key raw materials. Uh, and typically, we would always have sources, uh, you know, sourcing or suppliers close to uh, where we produce and also sometimes, uh, you know, uh, suppliers that are far, farther away. So we are not extremely dependent uh, on China and uh, typically we have multi-sourcing. Uh, so we, uh, we continue to adjust uh, the, the suppliers and the, the, how to load uh, different suppliers depending on the situation. So it's good to hear that uh, the lockdowns in, in Shanghai and the rest of China as having a li- limited, very limited impacts on on things. Yeah, very limited impact uh, uh, on raw materials. Maybe a little bit more uh, on uh, on the vessels. Uh, so the the biggest challenge uh, because the, the 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 supply chain is disrupted for two reasons. On the one hand, is uh, there is a scarcity of raw material, so there is higher demand compared to the supply, and that creates tension. And this will normalize step by step, but uh, it will take some time. The second big uh, challenge that we face is uh, scarcity on uh, on transportation. And this has been a greater issue compared to uh, to the raw materials, uh, like just difficulties to find, uh, you know, vessels to move the goods uh, on the water and, uh, and trucks. And this uh, lockdown had an impact on that. Uh, but we had already moved uh, our supply mostly to uh, to Europe and, and the U.S., uh, so closer to the factories uh, to uh, to prevent that, because that had been an issue already before the lockdown. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, did you ha- ever think about a good brand name because you especially produce uh, for uh, for retailers under de- their name? Uh, do you have own brand names? Yes. So we do have... Um, so basically, uh, uh, up to now, we've had uh, three business models. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we are, you know, the leading supplier for retailer brands in Europe. So basically, we produce... Uh, for uh, all the brands uh, or the big retailers uh, across uh, the different geographies. The second piece is the, the healthcare business. So basically supplying hospital, nursing homes, and also the specialized retailers like pharmacies. And in that business, we have our own brands like ID uh, that we sell uh, mostly in the uh, West, Northern Europe, and Serenity mostly on the southern uh, South Europe. So you need to have your brands because you go uh, on specialized retails and they don't have uh, you know, their, their own private labels. And the third uh, business was our own brands, the traditional branded business. So basically having brands and, uh, and uh, with all the marketing activities uh, on the brands. So um, last year, at the end of last year, we decided that uh, you know, the complexity, uh, our business was too complex. Uh, not so much because of the geographies that we serve, but because of the because each business model has a different approach and requires different capabilities. So we have decided to focus on uh, what we do best and where we have a strong position, uh, which is uh, retailer brands or, or partner brands, which is retailer brands and also lifestyle brands. So serving the brands of others and then the healthcare uh, channel uh, that uh, is evolving. Uh, so and we see a migration from uh, you know consumption in institutions, so people being taken care in you know elderly homes or hospitals to more home care, and with that is also an evolution on on our go to market. And as a consequence of that, uh, we are in the process of um, of uh, divesting our traditional branded business 
Uh, so to the question is more focus on, on uh, you know, others' brands and specialized brands and less on the mass, mass uh, read, uh, own brands. So we can hear something about it in the near future, perhaps. Yes. Okay. Another question is, uh, well, we had several questions regarding uh, your cost savings programs. Noel asks, uh, Ontex has gone through several cost savings programs, including on materials, services, uh, sourced from third parties. Uh, and he thinks that you were known as being tough to your suppliers. I don't know whether it's true. And his main question is, is it possible that your suppliers and external providers have in the current seller's markets disproportionately penalized Ontex? For example, by not giving you priority access uh, or uh, by charging more than your competi- uh, uh, more than to Ontex than to competitors, for example? It's difficult to, uh, to, to say if uh, you know, we are being more penalized than others. The reality is that there is a scarcity uh, of materials in the market. Uh, I do believe that uh, we have uh, good relationships with our suppliers. Uh, you know, my uh, objective is to have a strategic partnerships and relationship with suppliers where, of course, there is always uh, some tension uh, because we need to be cost competitive. Our customers are demanding a very competitive cost, but at the same time, it is more than ever, it is important to partner with suppliers because we see um, an acceleration on uh, and an evolution on the use, uh, the type of raw materials that are being used. Uh, on the one hand, to be more cost effective, but also uh, uh, for sustainability. Uh, there is a big transition. And uh, for me, uh, the only answer is to partner with suppliers and, uh, and to uh, work together to develop the right uh, products uh, so that we can continue to, uh, to be more sustainable. Um, so uh, the answer I would say is no. I don't think we, we've had uh, issues with suppliers because being tough with them in the past. Okay. Simon has another question on uh, the costs. Uh, in your annual, annual report, you claim that you will remain agile. Uh, he says, is there room for further cost cutting? Yeah. I do believe that there is always room uh, for uh, cost uh, improvement. Uh, I, uh, what I, uh, I did, uh, one of the first things that I did when I arrived uh, a year and a half ago is, uh, you know, to put in place a program uh, that would allow us uh, uh, to change the way we work uh, and uh, to implement a continuous improvement type of mindset and to look at costs in a different way uh, not so much uh, in silos, but across the board. And maybe I can give you a couple of examples. So yeah, with sure. this program, uh, uh, which is a program that is, Uh, necessary to survive in many industries, uh, you can continue to deliver cost improvement every year. Uh, And uh, our objective is to reduce uh, our cost by 4% every year. And we did that uh, in 21 and we continue to do so in 22. So uh, maybe a couple of examples uh, of this is uh, on the one hand is with the scarcity of raw materials, uh, um, uh, looking at uh, designs of products uh, that are uh, use less material, and as a consequence, you uh, reduce the cost. Uh, so 20 years ago, uh, your baby diapers and, and femme care products and adult products were you really using a lot of fluff and were very thick uh, products. Uh, and uh, over time, they have evolved to being, uh, um, you know, using less uh, material, uh, more sophisticated cores uh, that uh, have a high level of absorbency with channels. Um, using uh, different types of uh, absorbents uh, and uh, as a consequence uh, we produce uh, products that are more better performance, uh, more discreet uh, for uh, for consumers and, uh, and at, a, at the same time uh, lower cost. Yeah. Si- Simon also asks, uh, does that have an impact on uh, your margins? Is that positive for the margins? Uh? On, on the cost reduction actions or? Y- y- yes. Yes, and, and, and using less uh, resources to make a diaper. No, of course, uh, you know, the, the objective is to reduce the cost and improve the margin. So uh, typically uh, part of the cost improvement you pass to the market, to the consumers and to the customers and, and part is uh, to, uh, to improve margins. So definitely. And uh, of course, I mean, it's always about sustainability, eh? using less, uh, less uh, raw materials. The second example that is a little different uh, would be to look at uh, uh, the total cost to serve. Um, so not uh, looking at... Uh, um, uh, manufact- procurement, manufacturing, and, and uh, logistic in isolations, but uh, looking at uh, you know the, the the lowest cost to serve, and that has led us to uh, uh, look at our uh, footprint and uh, making making uh, our factories maybe more specialized. Uh, uh, 
on the products uh, that uh, that uh, are sold closer to that uh, plant. Um, but also uh, in, the, in, the, in the factories, uh, looking at uh, how can we become more efficient in each of the factories by improving the output of each of our machines, assets, uh, and also reducing the, the, the waste of materials, eh, which is a burden in the industry. Like, uh, yeah, Very important, of course, uh, at this moment uh, yeah. to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. Yes. Uh, Luc V has a question on uh, your balance sheet. Uh, he says, uh, how is Esther looking... Uh, at the goodwill on the balance uh, sheets, as it is a considerable, a considerable amount, uh, which investors do not like. More than goodwill, I think it refers to depth. Maybe uh, could it be the depth, uh, uh, the level of depth that we there, have? There uh, are some other questions regarding okay, the debt depth. level as well. So no, uh, I the, don't know how. On the, on the goodwill, is there a lot of goodwill on your balance? No, I mean the goodwill is uh, is uh, fully in line. I mean we don't have a problems with goodwill. This is something that is, uh, I mean, as a li publicly listed company is checked uh, at a yearly basis and audited. Uh, and typically there are uh, you know ways to calculate uh, uh, whether the goodwill that you have in the balance sheet is in line with uh, with the business that you have and I can confirm that uh, you know we monitor that uh, normally and uh, it is fully in line with the uh, with the business that we have uh, um, yeah so do, we, do you want me to no 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 it's, it's, it's perfect uh, uh, another question rolls in from uh, Simona VD uh, she asks is in Dontex active in too many regions because you're really a global uh, supplier mm -hmm. and there must be big differences between markets. Uh, and then another question that you already responded, do we have activities in Russia? So we covered that. But uh, are you active in too many regions? Yeah, so. Great question. So um, yes, we are active in, in many regions, uh, but the complexity uh, is not created by the number of regions uh, that you serve, but uh, the different business models. And in fact, as I commented yesterday, what we have decided is to simplify the business models uh, and the, to continue to supply uh, different regions. Typically, uh, you know, there are differences, of course, on consumer uh, uh, um, on consumer preferences, I would say, because the need is universal. Consumer preferences and also links to, uh, you know, the, 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 the level of income that you have in the different regions. But all in all, uh, you know, we sell uh, similar products in the different regions. And I do see uh, serving different regions as, a, as, a, as an opportunity, opportunity and as an asset. Maybe different from uh, other competitors that are more local because it allows us to uh, leverage. Uh, so to have a global uh, research and development uh, team uh, footprint, we have uh, you know kind of what we call global product platforms. Uh, so we use the same uh, chassis of products uh, for uh, all the regions and uh, um, move innovation from region to region uh, because uh, typically innovation move uh, from east to west. So uh, very often we move uh, some of our innovation solutions from Europe to uh, to the to North America and also uh, Latin America. Okay. Another question rolls in uh, on the debt level. Uh, Guido V asks, what about your debt level? I think it's it, it's risen above uh, five uh, at this moment. And isn't the increase in interest rates that we are seeing now problematic? Yes. So the depth level ha has been an issue since I started. And when I arrived, uh, you know, I gave myself a uh, three main objectives for the short term. Uh, one is, uh, you know, as I arrive, uh, our revenues had declined for the, uh, several years. Uh, so my objective was to stop the revenue decline, to stabilize the revenues and find a path back to growth. And I, I, I'm very proud we are doing very well and maybe I can come back to that. The second was, was to reduce the cost and to become more cost effective and we are making good progress. And the third main objective was to reduce the level of depth. Because in itself, a high level of depth is not a bad thing as far as you have a plan to reduce it. And uh, I do believe that, uh, you know, especially in the current uh, environment with, uh, you know, the, 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 the high level of volatility, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, the, the level of depth is it's, it's a risk, it's a challenge. Um, so uh, can you do something about it? So on the one hand, what we uh, what we did uh, last year is to refinance completely our depth uh, using uh, different instruments. Uh, so in the past, uh, we had uh, only term loans. And uh, in the middle of last year, we refinanced completely the depth uh, and uh, most of our depth now is uh, a bond instrument with maturity 2026 with a very low uh, uh, interest rate uh, and that's uh, kind of fixed. And uh, a, small po a smaller portion of the depth is, uh, is a term loan uh, with a level of interest that is following the Euribor. Uh, but this is the, 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 a, a very small portion of, uh, 
of the debt, uh, and of course uh, that will be impacted by by the raise uh, in interest. But we are uh, working on uh, on reducing the debt on the one hand uh, uh, through uh, you know the EBITDA uh, margins uh, that we will produce, but also um, we didn't talk about that as a consequence of uh, our strategy and the decision of. Uh, um, defocusing um, from uh, you know the traditional branded business, we are in the process of uh, divesting uh, those uh, businesses. And uh, we can you elaborate on that? Uh, the divesting process. On the debt, uh, we will use the proceedings uh, okay. uh, to pay down debt, especially the term loan, so that we can only have uh, the bond uh, which has a, ma- a long maturity. Uh, on the divestments, uh, yes, uh, we have three files uh, open uh, that are progressing very well. Uh, the files are one is, uh, uh, you know, the, the business in Mexico, the other one is Brazil, and uh, the last one is uh, Middle East and Africa. This is uh, the branded business that account for around 30% of uh, our revenues. And uh, we are getting very good level of interest. Um, um, some of the files are more advanced than others, but I would expect uh, some outcome uh, in the near future. Okay, we hear about that then. Um, we received lots of questions regarding the preliminary talks you're having with American industrial partners mm-hmm. uh, regarding the possible merger with one of uh, their companies, uh, the hygiene uh, products producer uh, Adindas. Uh, how are these talks evolving? And Simon Segers also asks any news about the merger uh, with AIP. Uh, another r- reader uh, Stephen asks, uh, there were takeover rumors. That's, of course, something else. Maybe first uh, on the merger. So maybe a, a couple of words on, on AIP at Indus. AIP is a, is a private equity, uh, American industrial partners uh, based in the U.S. They have uh, many different companies. Basically operating in, uh, in, um, in, um, in our industry in a similar way. So they are mostly focused on retailer brands and healthcare. Uh, they have operations both in uh, in the U.S. and in Europe, and the two companies are extremely complementary. So, uh, when as on the one hand, uh, you know, as we execute our strategy, on the one hand is reshaping the company and divesting uh, the businesses that are non-core, but at the same time, we are looking at opportunities to uh, uh, the opportunities that could help us accelerate and enhance our strategy. The main focus is executing the strategy and. Not necessarily we need to have a combination to do that, but uh, of course we always But you see it as a good fit. Yes, there is a a, a, a good fit. So uh, the, the, um, the discussions are uh, at, a, at a preliminary stage. Uh, you know, we are talking to uh, AIP. But you, you met them already, of, of course. Yes, yes, of course. Um, we are talking to them and assessing uh, what uh, form or shape uh, this combination could have and whether we can find a solution that... Uh, Creates value and uh, and uh, and and works for uh, for all the parties. Uh, so nothing too concrete now, but uh, of course we will communicate uh, if uh, as, as things uh, evolve. Okay, uh, S asks. There were also uh, some takeover rumors mm-hmm. uh, about Ontex uh, earlier this year. Can you provide an update on the status of those talks? I don't know how. No, I think, uh, honestly are. speaking, uh, you know, I, I cannot comment on rumors, but uh, I do believe that uh, our company is undervalued uh, today. I, I am convinced that uh, there is a huge opportunity uh, for improving yes, that, that's our an- performance. And uh, as a consequence of that, okay, yes, uh, you know, uh, uh, it is an opportunity uh, for a potential takeover. And that's why, in my view, there are a lot of rumors, uh, but nothing confirmed. And, you know, I cannot comment on, on any rumors. Uh. Okay, you say it's undervalued. Luc V asks, what, what is a fair value for the Ontex share uh, for you? Well, I think it's difficult. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I do believe that there is uh, actually, you know, uh, if I go back to uh, you know the midterm targets uh, that we uh, gave ourselves, um, you know we said that uh, I do see this company uh, growing every year with a steady growth. Uh, we gave ourselves a target to two to three percent every year. The reality is that uh, this year we are growing at a pace of uh, mid double digits, so 15, 16 percent. Uh, so it's much more than uh, what we thought. Also because there is inflation and the pricing plays a key role, but we see good growth and I do believe that as we focus uh, on certain uh, uh, geographies, certain categories, we will see this company growing and that's important because it's the engine uh, between the growth and the better mix because we are focusing on categories that are accretive in in terms of margin and the cost reduction uh, uh, efforts, uh, our margins will expand 
in the short term, uh, we see a hit of inflation. So inflation and uh, the cost can, of... Uh, can you pass that through? We, do, we can pass that through. And the challenge that we see is uh, we have the plans to fully offset and enhance our margins. It's just the speed with which uh, we can execute our plans in terms of growth uh, and cost reduction versus uh, the violent hit uh, of uh, inflation is just a disconnection in terms of timing. But uh, step by step, uh, we will catch up and then we will uh, continue to, uh, to, uh, to deliver our strategy and, and enhance the margins. Uh, I guess the, it's not the... easy to talk to the supermarket chains at this moment. Yeah, if you want to increase your prices. No, but of course, uh, uh, price increases are, uh, are a must. Uh, it is, uh, there is no way to uh, fully offset uh, inflation with, uh, with uh, cost and, and growth. Uh, so we are in the process of uh, uh, increasing our prices everywhere and, and we will continue doing so as, uh, as, as needed. It's just that, uh, again, the, the speed, uh, it takes time. Uh, you, know, you need to negotiate, mm -hmm. you need to implement. Uh, a, there is a time gap uh, between uh, you know, being hit with a very... Um, you know, aggressive increase uh, of uh, of the cost uh, on everything eh, that uh, that we manage. It's not only raw materials; it's raw materials, it's packaging, it's transportation, it's electricity, it's everything. Versus, you know, how fast you can offset. But uh, you know, in the medium term, uh, of course, we will fully offset and we will continue to enhance uh, margins. And as we do that, I do believe that our our uh, share price uh, will develop, uh, and I do believe that it will be more exponentially. Okay, let's hope so because your share price is very resilient this year. You you are positive since New Year, which is much better than uh, the indexes, of course, at yeah. this moment. Um, regarding the future uh, of Ontex, Linda VW asks, how are the relations with your main shareholder, uh, the holding GBL? Did they indicate they want to sell their, partic their participation or rather increase it through a delisting, for example? Can, uh, can you say something about that? As far as I that? understand, uh, they have not indicated anything. Uh, the relationship is, has always been very good. Uh, it is very good. Uh, we have a represent, representation of GBL in our board of directors. Uh, and, uh, GBL has always been very supportive of the company and they continue to support the company. So, no. Okay. You already talked a lot about uh, Ontex and your strategy. Steph VD asks, uh, why should I stay on board as a shareholder? I do believe that uh, uh, you know the, uh, the there is a huge potential for uh, developing the company, and as a consequence, uh, the share price will uh, will uh, develop. Uh, so I I am convinced that uh, uh, we will uh, create value for our shareholders uh, going forward. Okay, Hizel uh, has another question. Uh, you already talked a bit about it. What about selling your activities in South America? Where exactly are you in that process? Yeah, we are. Um, so we started uh, at the end of last year as we announced the new strategy. Um, we have engaged uh, advisors, uh, three different advisors for the three files that we are managing. So as I said, uh, Mexico, one file, Brazil and uh, Middle East and Africa. And uh, we have got already non-binding offers uh, and we are in the process, uh, due diligence process. So we have made the selection. It is a competitive uh, bidding process and uh, we are in So it's in already of, relatively uh, far due, due advanced, yeah. yes. Okay. You never know uh, with these processes, but it is well advanced, yeah. Okay. Yes, ask, is there a certain country or region where you plan to invest more aggressively? You already talked about the US. Are there... Other yes, I think uh, in a, if if I had to, say, it's it's mostly you. If I think about two things uh, where we will uh, invest heavily is U.S. and adult, uh, adult as a category. Uh, so in the U.S., uh, you know, we are making significant investments. Uh, we are opening a new plant. Uh, we are uh, bringing new lines, complete new lines, on baby, FM care, and in the future, adult. Uh, as I said, it's a huge market, and I do believe that we can disrupt the market with our innovation and, and have a very good growth. Adult, as a category, is the second area where we will focus our investments because uh, the population is aging. Um, so uh, we will have more and more consumers uh, in, in the segment. Uh, uh, you know, people live for longer, for a longer period of time, and people uh, stay uh, um, more active longer. Uh, so there is a need uh, of uh, our products, and also it, there is the a demography helps you. Of the, course. the demography helps dramatically, uh, and also there is an evolution of the type of products that are consumed. So it's a big opportunity for growth and innovation in that category, and that's why we are focusing investments on the different channels, on retail, but also 
around the institutions, as I commented before, with the smart diaper. And then the last piece where we are focusing significantly investments that today is mostly U.S., but I guess and I believe that it will move into Europe, is these lifestyle brands, this kind of... Uh, premium, strong purpose type of brands uh, that, uh, in my view, the new generation... Like du durable diapers or... Uh, it's, uh, more, it, it's know, more than uh, diapers. It's, it's more than diapers. It's, uh, it's uh, sustainable diapers uh, that uh, are good for the planet. Uh, it's uh, about uh, taking care of, uh, you know, you, uh, the babies. Uh, and uh, you, these, these brands are growing very, very fast in the U.S. And uh, we see a trend uh, of uh, uh, coming into Europe. Okay, uh, Luc V asks, uh, how does Antex experience the discussions with relay retailers? And you already talked about that, but is there any difference in the attitude of the retailers in Europe versus the USA? Or is it similar? Mm. No, I don't think, uh, I mean, um, the retailers with which, I mean, retailers are pretty well organized and uh, they, they have sophisticated organizations, good capabilities. No, the, the Yankees are not harder than the Europeans. No, I don't think, no, I think, I don't think there is a significant difference between Europe and, and the U.S. If then you, you would think about more Latin America or the emerging markets, there is a significant difference because the, the, the retail environment is much more fragmented. So typically you deal with smaller organizations, but I don't see big differences between the U.S. and, and Europe. Okay. Linda asks, maybe she's a shareholder and a bit concerned, when do you see room to pay a dividend again? Good question. Um, I mean, I, I think it's difficult to say at this point. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think we need to focus on, uh, on uh, improving the financial structure of the company first. Uh, so that we can have a very healthy business. Uh, Redu to, reducing your debt first. Yes, I think, uh, you know, this is my main objective at this point. Uh, of course, I mean, the, the decision on dividends is a board decision. But uh, up to now, in the last couple of years, the board didn't uh, um, um, consider appropriate uh, to distribute dividends considering the level of uh, debt that we have. But uh, yeah, I would expect, uh, you know, with the divestments uh, to be able to significantly reduce the level of debt and, and, and then we'll see. Okay, maybe in a couple of years then. Or sooner, who knows? Uh, Bert wonders whether you can uh, create more value for the shareholders on a standalone basis rather than uh, merging. Uh. So the question is uh, whether uh, we can create more value? Uh, yes. And that's, that's is, is Ontex viable on a standalone basis? And would that create value for the shareholders? Oh, definitely. And in fact, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, you know, uh, my, my, my strategy is an, an, on a standalone basis. And uh, I do believe that we will create significant value. And, but of course, I mean, we always look at uh, potential combinations, whether we can accelerate that value creation. And the reason why we are in discussions uh, is because we need to make sure that this makes sense for on-tech shareholders, at least from our side. Of course, AIP, we look uh, at their interest. So we need to make sure that if, if we reach an agreement, it's something that will, will accelerate and create more value than on a standalone basis. Okay. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. And LVD asks, uh, isn't your, maybe a rough question, isn't your business mo model outdated? Mm -hmm. There is so much competition, he adds. Uh, okay, so that I think there are two questions in one. Uh, yes, there is competition, uh, but I, I mean, this is maybe... A, and it's not a, tougher a made, than a, made, a couple of years ago. Or? I think, in my view, competition is good because it forces you to, to get better and better. Uh, um, I mean, and this could be perceived as a, you know, a made uh, sentence. And has the competition got harder the last couple of um, years or not? I mean, the competition is hard, uh, but uh, uh, not only from the manufacturing perspective, but in the, from the retail landscape perspective. You know, the biggest challenge that we face, especially on the baby categories like retailers, uh, use this category to compete against each other. Uh, they used to generate traffic because, uh, you know, families with babies are very loyal um, because typically the, the basket uh, uh, value is uh, it's much higher. Uh, so there is a lot yeah, we, of... Uh, we often see in Belgium buy one, get a second for free. So the, the, that's that's the challenge, no? So that this category is uh, extremely competitive, maybe more than the other categories. Uh, I think competition, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard and uh, the solution and the recipe is always be better than them. And I believe that we have, uh, you know, all the principles uh, to do so. There was a second part of the question, which is uh, the, the business model. I mean, whether the business yes. model is obsolete. I don't believe so. I think uh, the only thing that uh, um, I think we need to watch and uh, and to have a clear strategy is, uh, you know, the go-to-market. Uh, because the go-to-market, uh, you know, the needs of consumers 
are the same. These are universal and it's a good thing because even in crisis times, even maybe if there is recession, we could even benefit from that because we sell uh, necessary products that will be used uh, on an ongoing basis at uh, an affordable uh, price. Uh, and we see today with the level of inflation, not only in emerging markets, but in mature markets, uh, a shift of demand from a brands to, to slowly, but uh, shift uh, to private labels. So private labels are gaining uh, market share. So, which uh, is very beneficial for which you, Which is beneficial for Ontex, and it's moving slowly, but I do believe that this trend will continue as far as we can offer you know, the, the good solutions. The, the, the question is more on making sure that uh, we continue to evolve uh, the type of products to, uh, as, as the population needs evolve, uh, more discrete, uh, as I said, the population being more active, especially on adult, more discrete products. And also we need to watch on the go-to-market because we do see a shift to online, uh, from the traditional uh, in-store uh, uh, purchase to online. And I do believe that uh, uh, with the new generations, this will accelerate. Eh? And every year we see uh, more and more sales doing online. And we need to make sure that, uh, you know, we work with our customers uh, so that they are well equipped uh, to, uh, to, to, take to, to, uh, to gain their fair share in that channel. Okay. Um Maybe the, the old Ontex owner, Bart van Malderen, has created his own uh, diaper uh, company. Is that a, a serious competitor for you? Do you see it uh, as yeah, uh, of the, course, uh, it say, the same threat as a Procter & Gamble or Kimberly Clark, for example? I mean, it, it is one of our competitors uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it is a good competitor and we continue to, uh, to work uh, in order to be better than them. Uh, but of course, yes, it is a competitor and it's a... A very valid competitor. Okay, maybe a last question. Simona asks, uh, "Do you have Ontex shares yourself?" Good question. So, uh, you know, I, a big portion of my compensation is uh, a very significant portion is on uh, on uh, on shares. Uh, so, my all my long term incentive is uh, is based on share based. Not nowadays, uh, even if I would like. Uh, to purchase shares uh, because I do believe that our share price is undervalued because of all the projects uh, that we are working on. Uh, you know, it is difficult uh, because I am aware of all uh, the projects. So as you know, uh, as a publicly listed company, there is a significant amount of scrutiny and we need to make sure that uh, that we stay compliant with um, with the regulation. So it is not a good moment for me. Uh, so it would be a good moment for me to purchase uh, but unfortunately, it's not. Uh, it's not allowed at yeah. this moment. But let's hope that you can, you and your team can create uh, some additional value for uh, all the shareholders. Uh, thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to have you with us, and uh, there were some very interesting interesting questions, and of course, very interesting answers. Thank you for having thank me you. here. A pleasure. Okay. Thank you, we see you later.